So, what we are going to talk about this evening is impacted by a big asteroid. There's tons of stuff on the Earth each day, about 100 times. Most of its fine dust is tiny, tiny particles. But what we are going to mainly concern this evening is bigger stuff. The bigger stuff is probably originally from an asteroid. There are millions of asteroids. There is the formation of the planets, probably because Jupiter's gravity prevented a planet from forming. So, what we are going to talk about this evening is impacted by a big asteroid. There's tons of stuff on the Earth each day, about 100 times. Most of its fine dust is tiny, tiny particles. But what we are going to mainly concern this evening is bigger stuff. The bigger stuff is probably originally from an asteroid. There are millions of asteroids. There is the formation of the planets, probably because Jupiter's gravity prevented a planet from forming. Help us understand what entrepreneurship means to you. Is it just about starting companies? Not at all, Dina. I think, for me, entrepreneurship is about transforming things by initiating by taking new ideas, by seeing them from concept into practice, so that the impact of the idea is larger than it would be. Let's say, if you just wrote a publication about it. So, I think it's finding creative ways to solve problems to do new things, and I think that's what it's about. So, I think entrepreneurship can happen inside universities, I think we try to think of ourselves as an entrepreneurial university. We take risks, we try new things, and I think that's an important asset for anyone who wants to lead an organization or lead change. Help us understand what entrepreneurship means to you. Is it just about starting companies? Not at all, Dina. I think, for me, entrepreneurship is about transforming things by initiating by taking new ideas, by seeing them from concept into practice, so that the impact of the idea is larger than it would be. Let's say, if you just wrote a publication about it. So, I think it's finding creative ways to solve problems to do new things, and I think that's what it's about. So, I think entrepreneurship can happen inside universities, I think we try to think of ourselves as an entrepreneurial university. We take risks, we try new things, and I think that's an important asset for anyone who wants to lead an organization or lead change. It's a painting competition for artists who are living or professionally based in the UK. There's no stated age limit on it, but it does tend to attract graduate level and above artists. Historically, it has had different sections to it. There was, in the 60s, a sculpture section, but that was phased out, and that certainly now we're dealing with works that are in, as the rules state, any painted medium. Some of the works, if you look in detail what's in this exhibition, incorporate things like collage, inks, watercolors, for example.
It's a painting competition for artists who are living or professionally based in the UK. There's no stated age limit on it, but it does tend to attract graduate level and Bob artists. Historically, it has had different sections to it. There was, in the 60s, a sculpture section, but that was phased out and that certainly now we're dealing with works that are in, as the rules state, any painted medium. Some of the works, if you look in detail what's in this exhibition, incorporate things like collage, inks, watercolours, for example. I think it's often underestimated the connection between doing research, live research, and teaching undergraduates and the undergraduate programs. Because, of course if you're working at CERN on a frontier experiment you come back to give a lecture, you're buzzing with activity of what's going on your new results. It just makes the whole lecture much more interesting for students. It's always really exciting to look ahead at new science and what might happen in the future. I must say, lots depends on what we find in the next few years at the start of the Large Hadron Collider. We are expecting to find very many new phenomena. So the thing we'll want to be building in 10 years time will depend on what we find. I think it's often underestimated the connection between doing research, live research, and teaching undergraduates and the undergraduate programs. Because, of course if you're working at CERN on a frontier experiment you come back to give a lecture, you're buzzing with activity of what's going on your new results. It just makes the whole lecture much more interesting for students. It's always really exciting to look ahead at new science and what might happen in the future. I must say, lots depends on what we find in the next few years at the start of the Large Hadron Collider. We are expecting to find very many new phenomena. So the thing we'll want to be building in 10 years time will depend on what we find. I'm absolutely delighted first of all to have been appointed to this professorship. The role is going to be about public engagement in science. It is about making science accessible to as wide an audience as possible. It's about encouraging young people to think about science as a career. It's about making it easier for our academics here at the University of Birmingham to talk about their research to the general public. And it's not just about a one-way flow of information. It very much is about a dialogue. I'm absolutely delighted first of all to have been appointed to this professorship. The role is going to be about public engagement in science. It is about making science accessible to as wide an audience as possible. It's about encouraging young people to think about science as a career. It's about making it easier for our academics here at the University of Birmingham to talk about their research to the general public. And it's not just about a one-way flow of information. It very much is about a dialogue. During the past week, 
NPR has been reporting on the growing income gap in America. Economists say one big reason for the widening divide is the steady loss of manufacturing jobs. As more and more U.S. companies move factory jobs overseas, people who lack skills and education have trouble making a decent living. When the carrier air conditioning company shut down its Syracuse, New York plant in 2004, 1,200 jobs were lost. The current financial state of the laid-off workers depends on their skills, age, and degree of determination. During the past week, NPR has been reporting on the growing income gap in America. Economists say one big reason for the widening divide is the steady loss of manufacturing jobs. As more and more U.S. companies move factory jobs overseas, people who lack skills and education have trouble making a decent living. When the carrier air conditioning company shut down its Syracuse, New York plant in 2004, 1,200 jobs were lost. The current financial state of the laid-off workers depends on their skills, age, and degree of determination. Emerald is defined by its green color. To be an emerald, a specimen must have a distinctly green color that falls in the range from bluish green to slightly yellowish green. To be an emerald, the specimen must also have a rich color. Stones with weak saturation or light tone should be called green barrel. If the barrel's color is greenish blue, then it is an aquamarine. If it is greenish yellow, it is heliodor. This color definition is a source of confusion. Which you, tone and saturation combinations are the dividing lines between green barrel and emerald. Professionals in the gem and jewelry trade can disagree on where the lines should be drawn. Some believe that the name emerald should be used when chromium is the cause of the green color, and that stones colored by vanadium should be called green barrel. Calling a gem an emerald instead of a green barrel can have a significant impact upon its price and marketability. This color confusion exists within the United States. In some other countries, any barrel with a green color no matter how faint is called an emerald. Emerald is defined by its green color. To be an emerald, a specimen must have a distinctly green color that falls in the range from bluish green to slightly yellowish green. To be an emerald, the specimen must also have a rich color. Stones with weak saturation or light tone should be called green barrel. If the barrel's color is greenish blue, then it is an aquamarine. If it is greenish yellow, it is heliodor. This color definition is a source of confusion. Which you, tone, and saturation combinations are the dividing lines between green barrel and emerald. Professionals in the gem and jewelry trade can disagree on where the lines should be drawn. Some believe that the name emerald should be used when chromium is the cause of the green color, and that stones colored by vanadium should be called green barrel. Calling a gem an emerald instead of a green barrel can have a significant impact upon its price and marketability. This color confusion exists within the United States. In some other countries, any barrel with a green color no matter how faint is called an emerald.
And as far as getting acquired, I mean, you know, we're trying to focus on the product. I think that if you know a lot of companies are built to be acquired and I think what happens there is you leave yourself in a really vulnerable spot because you're growing and you say, hey, I want to hire that expensive VP of whatever because, hey, man, any day now we're going to get acquired and then your product winds up suffering. So I think you need to really want to do the company because you don't know how long you're going to be at it. And luckily I've been searched a long time. I don't want to stay in search. So you know, it's fine with me, whatever happens with the company. But you have to focus on building the product to making the product better and you have to focus on building a sustainable company. And as far as getting acquired, I mean, you know, we're trying to focus on the product. I think that if you know a lot of companies are built to be acquired and I think what happens there is you leave yourself in a really vulnerable spot because you're growing and you say, hey, I want to hire that expensive VP of whatever because, hey, man, any day now we're going to get acquired and then your product winds up suffering. So I think you need to really want to do the company because you don't know how long you're going to be at it. And luckily, I've been searched a long time. I don't want to stay in search, so you know it's fine with me whatever happens with the company. But you have to focus on building the product to making the product better and you have to focus on building a sustainable company. For many years the favorite horror story about abrupt climate change was that a shift in ocean currents could radically cool Europe's climate. These currents, called the overturning circulation, bring warm water and warm temperatures north from the equator to Europe. Susan Lucier, an oceanographer at Duke University, says scientists have long worried that this ocean circulation could be disrupted. For many years the favorite horror story about abrupt climate change was that a shift in ocean currents could radically cool Europe's climate. These currents, called the overturning circulation, bring warm water and warm temperatures north from the equator to Europe. Susan Lucier, an oceanographer at Duke University, says scientists have long worried that this ocean circulation could be disrupted. To begin with, you should be standing in the main floor of the British Library. British Library is situated on the Euston Road next to some pipe crustacean press in the foyer to the left of the information desk. It was a large white staircase. Follow this up towards the gallery at the top of the stairs. Oz and look to your left for attention. This is Robert Cotton, born in 1570 and died in 1631. Cotton was a member of Parliament but he is mainly known as a great antiquarian collector of manuscripts. It is the covenant we have a great depth and the survival of many English manuscripts. Throughout this tour, we will see his legacy. To begin with, you should be standing in the main floor of the British Library. British Library is situated on the Euston Road next to some pipe crustacean press in the foyer to the left of the information desk. It was a large white staircase. Follow this up towards the gallery at the top of the stairs. 
Oz and look to your left for tension. This is Robert Cotton, born in 1570 and died in 1631. Cotton was a member of parliament, but he's mainly known as a great antiquarian collector of manuscripts. It is the covenant we have a great depth and the survival of many English manuscripts. Throughout this tour, we will see his legacy. If your senior citizen, music in the background may be distracting. But for younger people, experts at multitasking, it's apparently no big deal. That's according to a study in the journal Gerontologist. Researchers recruited 103 people, half between the ages of 18 and 30, the others between 60 and 75. The volunteers then took part in memorization exercises and a drill where they had to quickly match a photo of a face with the same face in an array of unfamiliar faces. Some participants did the exercises in silence. Others performed the tasks while listening to white noise or instrumental jazz, blues, classical and electronic music. Across age groups, the consensus was that the background sound was distracting but only older people's performance suffered when the noise was present. For example, older folks who did the face matching with music playing remembered 10% fewer faces. The result matches up with the theory that the elderly are less able to filter out what's called distracting task relevant information. In this case, the distracting info might have interfered with them storing the facial image in the first place, much less impeding their ability to remember it a short while later. If your senior citizen, music in the background may be distracting. But for younger people, experts at multitasking, it's apparently no big deal. That's according to a study in the journal Gerontologist. Researchers recruited 103 people, half between the ages of 18 and 30, the others between 60 and 75. The volunteers then took part in memorization exercises and a drill where they had to quickly match a photo of a face with the same face in an array of unfamiliar faces. Some participants did the exercises in silence. Others performed the tasks while listening to white noise or instrumental jazz, blues, classical and electronic music. Across age groups, the consensus was that the background sound was distracting but only older people's performance suffered when the noise was present. For example, older folks who did the face matching with music playing remembered 10% fewer faces. The result matches up with the theory that the elderly are less able to filter out what's called distracting task relevant information. In this case, the distracting info might have interfered with them storing the facial image in the first place, much less impeding their ability to remember it a short while later. I'm a big fan of gap years. I took one myself, so I'm probably biased. I think that if you've got something you want to do in the year before you come to university, that you should do it. And a lot of students who want to study a biology degree actually want to go off and travel and perhaps work on a conservation project. And of course, that's all very good. It will contribute towards your degree and your preparation for that. And then when you come to us, you'll be ready for your studies. So if there's something you really want to do, then my advice is to go for it.
I'm a big fan of gap years. I took one myself, so I'm probably biased. I think that if you've got something you want to do in the year before you come to university, that you should do it. And a lot of students who want to study a biology degree actually want to go off and travel and perhaps work on a conservation project. And of course, that's all very good. It will contribute towards your degree and your preparation for that. And then when you come to us, you'll be ready for your studies. So if there's something you really want to do, then my advice is to go for it. So it's a fantastic place to be a puffin. There are no ground predators. There is protection. On the other hand, if you're going to increase in numbers, and we increased from five pairs then to 2,000 pairs in 1972. When I started up to about 80,000 pairs in 2003, you've got to have a lot of food. I mean you've got to have a hell of a lot of fish however small a bird that you are. And there seems to be profound changes in the North Sea where man removed all the large fish, the large cod the haddock and those sorts of things, for human consumption. And the numbers of small fish increased and this allowed the seabirds to increase. You've got a lot of big fish that are of no use to seabirds, they're just too big. I mean puffins will only eat fish up to about 20 centimeters long. Anything bigger than that is safe from a puffin. So it's a fantastic place to be a puffin. There are no ground predators. There is protection. On the other hand, if you're going to increase in numbers, and we increased from five pairs then to 2,000 pairs in 1972. When I started up to about 80,000 pairs in 2003, you've got to have a lot of food. I mean you've got to have a hell of a lot of fish however small a bird that you are. And there seems to be profound changes in the North Sea where man removed all the large fish, the large cod, the haddock and those sorts of things, for human consumption. And the numbers of small fish increased and this allowed the seabirds to increase. You've got a lot of big fish that are of no use to seabirds, they're just too big. I mean puffins will only eat fish up to about 20 centimeters long. Anything bigger than that is safe from a puffin. Finally, we take a look at how to mix an unmixed liquid at the flick of a switch. Sandrine tells us more. Oil and water don't usually mix, but the new chemical sensitive to light has been added here to blend them together just as easily as it brought them together, it can also separate them out again. When exposed to UV light, the chemical changes its structure and becomes soluble in water. This causes two layers to form with the oil floating on top of the water chemical combo. This method should be cheaper than the current alternative which involves using high-energy centrifuges. Finally, we take a look at how to mix an unmixed liquid at the flick of a switch. Sandrine tells us more. Oil and water don't usually mix, but the new chemical sensitive to light has been added here to blend them together just as easily as it brought them together, it can also separate them out again. When exposed to UV light, the chemical changes its structure and becomes soluble in water. This causes two layers to form with the oil floating on top of the water chemical combo. This method should be cheaper than the current alternative which involves using high-energy centrifuges.
if sea levels continue to rise, eventually the property becomes inundated and the real value of the property, the vast bulk of its value will be in the value of the land which of course is then unusable. And that's of course not insured by property insurance. So at that point a lot of waterfront landowners and banks and other financial institutions that have lent money against the value of those properties are going to find that they suffer very serious losses and it's not at all obvious at the moment who would compensate them. If sea levels continue to rise, eventually the property becomes inundated and the real value of the property, the vast bulk of its value will be in the value of the land which of course is then unusable. And that's of course not insured by property insurance. So at that point a lot of waterfront landowners and banks and other financial institutions that have lent money against the value of those properties are going to find that they suffer very serious losses and it's not at all obvious at the moment who would compensate them. A nutrition expert at the University for What Him Unknown, say the simple sugar and candy bars can give you a quick boost. But after the initial rush, you usually crush it feel worse than before the snap. They say what you need is complex carbohydrates like a bagel or a bowl of not sugar coating cereal. Try carrying a variety of pack size box to work with you and buying a small carton of milk from the vending machine. Carbohydrates help you sustain a blood sugar level that is neither too high nor too low. That means you have a steady flow of energy to finish your day. A nutrition expert at the University for What Him Unknown, say the simple sugar and candy bars can give you a quick boost. But after the initial rush, you usually crush it feel worse than before the snap. They say what you need is complex carbohydrates like a bagel or a bowl of not sugar coating cereal. Try carrying a variety of pack size box to work with you and buying a small carton of milk from the vending machine. Carbohydrates help you sustain a blood sugar level that is neither too high nor too low. That means you have a steady flow of energy to finish your day. Thanks to blood's ability to clot even the surface of a nasty gas just able to heal up. But platelet cells aren't sticky all the time. And now researchers have identified the key protein that makes them come together. This video shows how normal cells spread out tiny arms to catch other cells and to grasp onto the surface of a wound. When the crucial protein is absent, the cells don't stick out their arms as much and can grip the surface of an injury as tightly. Thanks to blood's ability to clot even the surface of a nasty gas just able to heal up. But platelet cells aren't sticky all the time. And now researchers have identified the key protein that makes them come together. This video shows how normal cells spread out tiny arms to catch other cells and to grasp onto the surface of a wound. When the crucial protein is absent, the cells don't stick out their arms as much and can grip the surface of an injury as tightly.
Lawrence Stephen Lowry was an English artist. Many of his drawings and paintings depict Pendlebury, Lancashire, where he lived and worked for more than 40 years, and also Salford and its surrounding areas. Lowry is famous for painting scenes of life in the industrial districts of northwest England in the mid-20th century. He developed a distinctive style of painting and is best known for his urban landscapes people with human figures often referred to as matchstick men. He painted mysterious and populated landscapes, including portraits and the unpublished marionette works, which were only found after his death. Lawrence Stephen Lowry was an English artist. Many of his drawings and paintings depict Pendlebury, Lancashire, where he lived and worked for more than 40 years, and also Salford and its surrounding areas. Lowry is famous for painting scenes of life in the industrial districts of northwest England in the mid-20th century. He developed a distinctive style of painting and is best known for his urban landscapes people with human figures often referred to as matchstick men. He painted mysterious and populated landscapes, including portraits and the unpublished marionette works, which were only found after his death.